Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, just waiting for a few more people to join us this evening, so we'll be uh, starting very shortly. Uh, hello, Alex. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Mark. Yeah. As always, all sounds good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, if anyone can see me and can see my background and wants to uh, play along, you can have a guess at um, where this picture was taken. I don't know how big I am in most people's screens, so uh, it's um, yeah maybe a bit difficult. But if you can, if you can see and maybe guess where Alex is as well. If anyone wants to have a guess at that, you can put your answers in the chat chat box or just play along at home without without sharing your answers. <laughs> We will give you your answers as well in a minute. I'm not quite sure where mine was, to be honest. That's probably. Oh, no. I know it was. Annoying. Yours does look a little bit like uh, Scout Scar and Kendall until you realise how, how far away it is. Um, is that somewhere near Bristol? It is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm warm. I'm warm. Someone's, someone says Spain. And I think it does look a bit like Spain, actually. It was, it was a quite, a, it, it was after the dry spell of the last few months. So, uh, yeah. Yours is a bit. Yours is a bit greener, so I, I would assume it's Lake District or somewhere. It, it was, yeah. It was taken out, um, taken by a friend, Dan, uh, Dan Toll, a couple of weeks ago, actually, up uh, near Allswater. Oh, I've okay. Just, I've given it away, but they, need, but they need to guess which mountain I was on. <laughs> so, actually, I've had one, one correct answer so far. So, anyway, we will um, we'll make a start. So, um, my, my background is Cheddar Gorge, actually. So, uh, so... Um, Great, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, I just posted something in the chat. Um, so if anyone's got any questions for Alex as we go along, then please feel free to pop your questions in there and I'll be keeping an eye on it. So if I look like I'm um, looking down, then I'm, I'm just checking the chat so I can put as many questions to Alex as possible. Obviously, if you're on Zoom, that's great. You can use the chat box. If you're uh, watching us on Facebook, because we're streaming live to Facebook, then please use the comments section down um, underneath the video and you can pop your comments in there and they should reach me as well. I've got someone looking out for those. So I'll try and get as, try and get few through as many as possible in the next half an hour, 40 minutes. So um, fantastic. So um, it's really great to have Alex here. He's an endurance athlete, award-winning author, um, He's charity fundraiser, um, mental health campaigner. The list is is, is endless, really, Alex. Um, and it's been a while since we caught up. I think I saw you saw you about four years ago when you were doing a few talks in Bristol and Covent Garden and Manchester. And um, then you just come back from Everest. But obviously, uh, quite a few things have have changed since then. How's how's lockdown been for you the last few months? Yeah, well, it's great to be here, Mark. And again, I think, uh, I think, yeah, the last time I saw you would have been uh, at an Alice Brigham talk. Uh, proud to be an ambassador for the brand. Um, that's another, th that's another th you know, thing on the list. Um, I think uh, since, yeah, since lockdown, where did we start, really? I think uh, this year we need to just kind of plug it in and start again. Um, it's, it's been really interesting. You know, it's, it's, you know, most of the challenges we choose, you know, we get to choose, but this thing has been completely out of our hands and uh, we've kind of been dragged along if we like it or not. Um, and in some ways, you know, it's, it's, you know, I've, I felt quite grateful, you know, I've, I've managed quite well during this time. I've had a lot that I felt thankful for. And for me, it's been, you know, fairly easy compared to some, uh, as an introvert, I really enjoyed the time alone and just that sort of space. Um, but equally, it's brought its challenges. You know, it really has been tough at times. I think all of us have had our resilience, you know, put, you know, put on the test. Um, and I guess now we're coming to see some kind of light at the end of this tunnel. Um, we're just having to adapt as best we can. But I think obviously being, you know, being kind of self-employed, um, that's obviously been a very uncertain time. And uh, and yeah, it's been kind of nice to have sort of change in pace, but equally, um, like many people, plans and goals have been put on hold, have been taken out of my hands, and uh, we can't quite see the top of the mountain yet. So as always, trying to kind of find the opportunities, trying to find the positives, trying to, you know, trying to help other people you know, 
on the way, but also uh, at times I found it really, um, really quite difficult. And I think uh, if it wasn't for the ability to run and get outside and um, just to find some perspective and hope, I, I genuinely don't know how I would have handled it. And I felt incredibly grateful that, you know, I've got, I've got the hills on my doorstep um, and that I've stayed healthy. You know, I've not been in a high risk group, uh, you know, all my family are well. Um, so yeah, lots to be grateful for, but I think all of us have been on this roller coaster and, uh, you know, we have all been on in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. Yeah, I to totally agree with that. And, um, I've been going for more, more runs than normal just, um, and it's been, it has been uh, a real, um, savior at times. So, um, that's, that's great. That's good to hear. And, um, I, um, last time we met, you, um, you kindly gave me a copy of your, your book uh, Icefall and, um, and when I um, was coming to sort of organize this this talk uh, I sort of I reread the, the your autobiography and um, and the words that kind of came to mind about you that that sort of described you um, and particularly over the last five years what you've achieved a sort of resilient I think you said it there and um, determined and very driven um, but that's that's quite different from the person you were when you were younger, who um, pretty much hated sports, and um, and you were, you know, you, you you very much suffered a lot of adversity from bullying to um, your stammer and things like that. So, yeah, do you do you feel that you've 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 obviously used or channeled that adversity in a in a really positive way over the last few years? Um, do you feel it's been your kind of motivation? Definitely, yeah. I, mean, I think. To go back kind of to where the journey started, I was never a typical outdoors candidate. You know, um, I I was lucky to be brought up, you know, kind of near, you know, near the forest and, the, and kind of in the countryside. So I always enjoyed, be, you know, being out walking the dogs. But in terms of any challenges or physical sports, I was I was never really into that. Um, I think when I was about nine years old, um, things really changed for me because I was diagnosed with a mild form of epilepsy. Now that was, you know, brought under control, but was just the catalyst for a whole host of other challenges, such as anxiety and panic attacks, uh, having a bad stammer ever since I've been able to speak, which comes and goes when it likes, a bit like Donald Trump. Um, and it's just been, you know, it, it was it was a really unlikely journey. You know, I was relentlessly bullied throughout my entire time at school. So my confidence was, was down in the valley. Um, and even having a seizure in McDonald's when I was when I was about nine meant that even the smell of fast food could could cause a panic attack. So going through school was really spent just trying to manage this anxiety while some of my friends were, you know, more interested in, in football than PlayStation and, and so on. Um, and that really sent me on a different path, you know. Now, finding the outdoors by chance when I was about 13 or 14 uh, was that really kind of life-changing moment for me because I finally found somewhere where I, you know, where I belonged. I found a way to fight back, to, to prove myself, to prove all the bullies wrong. And suddenly your mindset shifts, you know, you become, you, you kind of move from this victim mindset to a victory mindset and realizing that actually the biggest barrier was myself. You know, and I started to realize that actually I had a choice. We don't always get to choose our challenges, like now, but we can choose how we respond. Um, and ultimately the outdoors was a way that where it was only myself versus the, you know, versus the environment. I wasn't being held back by anything else. And that was where the confidence, this passion came from. And from that early age, um, sent me on this journey to keep on challenging myself, keep on finding out what else I could overcome. And, uh, and ultimately now using those experiences to try and inspire people to overcome their challenges. Fantastic. So um, there may be people watching this who, who um, possibly don't know that you've you've attempted Everest twice, but um, I can't really speak to you, Alex, without maybe talking about Everest. Um, you, you, I'm sure you, you you may be tired of talking about it because you've done so much since. But um, one of the questions I wanted to ask about Everest, you, you attempted it first when you were 18, I think, um, in 2013, and then again, um, in 2015 both both times massive setback from an avalanche on your first um trip to the big earthquake in the second trip the um the question i wanted to say was 
you know, on, on that second trip, you were, your, your tent, or was it your first trip, got, your tent got taken out. Um, you should have been in your tent to some extent. Um, and how did you deal really with the, the sort of disappointment when you, you returned home of, of both those trips that had obviously been a long time in the making for them to be, you know, taken out of your hands? You were just talking about controlling the controllable sort of thing, but yeah. Good question. I mean, both trips are very different. And I guess you, many people would argue it wasn't so much a long time in the making because I'd, I'd kind of been able to do a lot in a short time um, and gone from, you know, setting the goal, setting the deadline, and actually four years later being at Everest Base Camp. That wasn't necessarily an approach that I would recommend. It wasn't necessarily an approach I take now, but I was able to put the steps in place to actually make that goal a reality, you know, in the Alps climbing, then Scotland, um, then a 7,000 metre peak in the Himalayas. So I'd, you know, I'd taken a, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a very um, shortcut approach, but um, a very unconventional approach to Everest. And, and so even if it hadn't necessarily been a lifetime goal, for many, for many people, they might spend, you know, 10, 20, 30 years training again, you know, moving towards Everest. Um, for me, it was the ultimate goal. It was the ultimate achievement, that ultimate way to uh, overcome, you know, all these early challenges. And uh, I wanted it more than anything. Um, so I guess even in a short time, there was still that emotional investment there. Uh, so naturally, yeah, there's a massive disappointment. And I think the, the key lesson for me from the first trip in 2014 was that actually, you know, the mountain doesn't give a damn how hard you've worked, how much you've spent. I mean, it's taken a year of fundraising, trying to raise about £35,000 in corporate sponsorship um, whilst working in a pub washing pots, you know, <laughs> uh, nothing glamorous about that. Um, so essentially, I, I, I dedicated more than a year just to that alone. And, uh, and then you realise that actually, you know, mountaineering is, is very much a gamble. Um, like anything in life, you learn you have two choices. You can see it as an excuse. You can complain. You can feel sorry for yourself or you can think, OK, what's the opportunity? Um, you know, and failure becomes another chance to win. So, yeah, you feel very frustrated and very reactive, but then quickly you start to you have to accept it to be able to move forward. So, you know, I was lucky to come home safely. There was an avalanche which killed 16 people. You know, mm -hmm. um, we didn't get to go on the mountain itself. So took that year to, to fundraise more, to, to, you know, change my approach in training. Um, and this peak you can see in the picture was the highest peak of Switzerland, the Dom. Uh, that was one of the peaks I climbed that, that, that summer after Everest. And ultimately, you know, you just, you turn it into a positive. Um, and in hindsight, it becomes a positive thing. Um, so 2015 went back to the mountain and this time was obviously very different because we were on the mountain when the Nepal earthquake hit. We were trapped at Camp One for two days. Uh, we got hit by a big powder avalanche, but actually we were in the, the safest place of all because sadly 22 people had died at base camp, including three of our own team. So naturally that was a very different process because you know you, you, you don't care about the goal at that point. Um, you know, you come home with this guilt, this just this horrible confusion, really. You know, you don't really want to be anywhere. And I guess for me, it's that sense of, you know, why them, why not me? Um, dealing with seeing base camp devastated, destroyed. Um, you know, dreams can be replaced, but lives can't. So that was a longer process, definitely. Yeah, so, so true. And from... So, so after you'd been to the Everest the second time, you sort of came back and it, it, it feels you threw yourself into sort of um, charity work and um, raising a lot of money from Nepal to help them rebuild after the avalanche. Um, and, and then charities like Young Minds, um, sort of culminating in, in winning, winning an award for, for, for raising all this money. Is that, is that, is that what um, happened? I think, yeah, when I came back, the natural response was to raise money for charity, you know, for the for the people in Nepal. I mean, over 9,000 people have, have been killed by the earthquake. Um, Everest was only a very, very tiny part of that. And so you see in this beautiful country, uh, beautiful people that become, you know, that become close friends, devastated, you know, and people that have so little but give so much. And so naturally to kind of cope with that kind of guilt and trauma, you, you have to do something positive. So... I did a few challenges, you know, to do that. I decided if I couldn't climb Everest, I was going to cycle it. 
Um, so there's a challenge called uh, Everesting, where you cycle the height of Everest in a day. Uh, that was good fun. Uh, it took about 21 hours on Great Don Fell in the Pennines. Um, and then that was raising money for the Himalayan Trust. Um, but then I started to work with a charity called Phase Worldwide. I've been an ambassador for them now for three years. We started a series called Walk for Nepal. Um, in three years, we've done Ben Nevis, Scarfield, Pike and Snowden. I think, I think that's raised about £40,000 now, um, which goes a long way in Nepal. Um, then did my kind of probably my biggest challenge to date, which was climb the UK in 2017, uh, which was for Young Minds. Um, and that's a, a kind of story in itself. Um, but because of that, I was actually lucky enough to be chosen as the uh, Pride of Britain uh, Granada Reports fundraiser of the year. So completely unexpected, um, but the most incredible recognition that you could ever, ever get, you know, to be from, you know, cycling through Scotland in, in pouring Scottish rain in the middle of nowhere to actually being in a room next to Prince Harry and, and what have you. It's just surreal. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's really inspiring. Um, what you did, what you did there. Um, what, one of the things, I mean, you, you touched on it there, um, the, um, the climb all the hundred UK's highest points. Um, I was, I was going to sort of say in, in your book, um, Icefall, you, you, you talk about how, um, obstacles are there to overcome. It feels like in your kind of challenges that you create for yourself, you sort of, you create an obstacle and then you, you sort of challenge yourself to overcome them. Is, is I mean, how do you, how do you come up with these challenges, you know? It's kind of uh, just interesting to, to understand. The process, it's, 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 it's interesting. With Everest, it was always really instinctive. And I just had this calling and, and nothing else had, had got me quite like that. Um, I think after Everest, there was, um, there was Chihuahua Yu in Tibet, which is the sixth highest peak in the world. And surprisingly enough, I didn't reach the top of that either. Um, but that's when I had this kind of shift in thinking towards you know, what am I, uh, well, ha had I been in that tent on Everest the year before, um, down at base camp, obviously, you know, I most likely wouldn't be here now. What would I have left behind? And started to realize that actually it's not just about the top, it's about the journey. So ultimately I realized I wanted to do something close to home. Um, and I kind of go through this kind of, almost this entrepreneurial type process where you're trying to find the idea, you've got a criteria, I set what I, you know. I set out what they need to be. It's got to tick enough boxes, and it takes a while. You know, you can be absolutely stressing over an idea because it's not quite right. Because it's got to find the balance between it's got to be challenging enough that it scares me, and to be on the edge of can I do this? Is this is this a bit too daft? Um, is it too easy? Is it too hard? And it's got to find that right balance. And essentially, I, I knew I wanted to do something else. Knew what I wanted to feel like. Um, for months and months and months, I couldn't get it, couldn't get it. Um, I've always wanted to do something a bit differently. You know, my whole life has been very unconventional um, in a number of ways. I've never liked the whole beaten track. Um, and I guess Everest wasn't so much unconventional. Um, and then eventually, I think I, I get to the point where I ask friends, you know, I ask people, I ask people for their opinions and I judge their, you know, I judge their response. If my mum threatens to break my legs, I'm generally nearly there. Um, <laughs> um, and then I think towards the end of that year, I got to that point where um, I was talking about this kind of moment um, where I kind of, you know, uh, imagined that kind of finish line, what that summit would look like. And these kind of goosebumps ran up my arm. I was having a coffee with a friend at the time and these goosebumps just ran all over my arm. And he just said to me, you know, that's your why you found it. And that was when I, I knew I had it because I'd only had that feeling when I imagined Everest. So I'm kind of looking for that moment, but until then, like any idea, you've just got to keep on stressing until you get there. But ultimately, yeah, you've got to almost find something that's just on the edge of challenging and make yourself accountable. You know, once I announce something, once I've committed, that's it. Um, the hard part is getting to that point of commitment because uh, by that point, you've kind of got no way out. You've got to do it. Um, it's a bit like throwing yourself in the deep end and learning to swim, but I've kind of always done it that way. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's just naturally how I approach it really. Oh, it's, I think it's a good way to be. I think if you, you kind of take, take too much time about it and you sort of take two tentative steps and, um, you, like you never, never... Yeah. <laughs> um, what's, what's been your biggest 
personal challenge would you say to to date um obviously you know yeah uh, in the outdoors or or personal because it cause um both really i mean the, the challenges that you've done and then yeah the, the sort of the personal challenges that you've overcome as well so the, the endurance challenges i guess and the personal challenges what's been the biggest good question i think they're all thing is they're all part of the same journey because for me the per, the physical challenges are a way of overcoming the personal ones that's what my, my journey has always been about and you know um I think, as you said before, to kind of set yourself a challenge, which we where we have a choice, whereas we don't have a choice to deal with a lot of the things in our personal lives. But for me, that's that process, that resilience we would gain along the way is is what makes that journey worthwhile. Um, I think on a venture perspective, uh, climb the UK was probably the toughest thing I'd done. I mean, that was sort of five thousand miles of cycling, walking, running, kayaking uh, in seventy-two days. Um, it only been done once before in that style. Um, by Johnny Muir and kind of you know I, I think I was faster than him but to be honest it wasn't so much about that it was just something very different a way to engage people around the UK a way to see so much more of our home soil which I never appreciated away in the Himalayas you know when you're in a tent halfway across the world actually finding there's so much adventure and, and, and possibilities on our home soil um, but that challenge really tested me because you've got day after day of, of effort, you know, cycling up, up to 122 miles, uh, 18 hour days, all weathers. Um, it wasn't like lockdown. It was like two and a half months of just rain and wind and, and everything. Um, and on Everest and the highest, on, on expeditions, you've got a lot of downtime. You spend a lot of time in your tent, eating biscuits, playing cards, waiting for the conditions and waiting for acclimatization. On that challenge, I, I always wanted it to be self-supported. So it was just, you know, me and the bike carrying stuff most of the time. Um, and that day-to-day -day effort um, combined with not eating enough and a few kind of rookie mistakes. Um, that race against time, you know, was, was exhausting. Um, I had everything to deal with, you know, chest infections. I tore a muscle in my quad on day five. Um, but I had the most amazing support. People really got behind it. It raised a lot of money because people loved that home adventure and, uh, and the mental health story. So that, that was the Everest I never had, really. Um, and of course, as you can see, that was the big finale, 72 days, 72 days later, bang on schedule. I could have taken more time and it wouldn't have been as physically challenging, but I would have been able to experience it more. But for me, the physical challenge is really important. Personally, though, I mean, I think my biggest challenge is probably mental health problems. You know, I mean, like many people, um, you know, I've suffered with the peaks and troughs over the years and probably over eight years now. And uh, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm openly talking about that now. But for a long time, I wasn't able to, um, especially as this adventurer and athlete and speaker. There was this perception of, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be mentally tough, whatever that means. And and, and yeah, I think um I've always been very much a, an all or nothing type. And then when these disasters or when there were setbacks out of my control, um, the balance has tipped. And, you know, I found myself um, facing a different kind of Everest. And um, I think that could be a very, very difficult, very hopeless place. You know, and for me, having challenges, having that purpose is what's got me through. Um, but ultimately, you know, that was the inspiration behind Climb the UK was it took me it took me longer to get an NHS appointment than to actually cycle, run and walk around the highest point of all the counties, which is quite worrying when you think about it. Um, I was lucky that I had the outdoors as a way to try and manage that, you know, to, to, to get me through. But I think, you know, anxiety, depression and an eating disorder, um, you know, which started uh, because of an injury when I couldn't run. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a different kind of mountain. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, the outdoors and having these challenges is, is what's given me a way through. And, uh, and hopefully to help other people talk about it as well, um, you know, to, to kind of put the hand up first, um, because it took me a long time to do that. And actually, by speaking out, it's helped other people too as well. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's really important and uh, good for you for, for doing that and, and writing about it as well in, in your book as well. It's kind of an easy thing to to do. Um, I'm going to dip into a few questions from people, uh, if that's okay. Um, so Richard Ellis asks, uh, Everest aside, would you go back to Nepal? Hi Richard. Yeah, well, you know, Richard has saved my skin on quite a few challenges up to date. So hi Rich. Um, I presume it's the same one, but the, you know, there's only one. 
Aside from, aside from Everest, I mean, I love Nepal. I've been lucky to go there uh, five times now. And the most rewarding trip I've actually had out there was my last one in 2017. Uh, after climbing the UK, uh, I was out there um, on behalf of a charity, just, you know, just uh, trying to actually visit, you know, you, know, you know, I went to actually see some projects um, out in the very, very rural Nepal and uh, see what the real Nepal is like away from the tourist side. And that was phenomenal. Um, you know, you're in the type of, you're, you're in the places where the kids are walking over mountains to get to school, um, you know, where they have to walk a day to get to the nearest shop. It's, it's amazing. Um, and I got to see some of the friends and people that I hadn't seen since the earthquake. So that was quite emotional. I think mentally and I think physically, I think kind of, I think spiritually I had to almost put some of those memories to bed, you know, because I'll never forget what we saw out there. Um, so that was an amazing trip and I'd love to go back, but I think at the moment I've just got so many other things and projects on that it's finding the time really. Um, as for the big mountains, Everest and, and the high mountains, I mean, it's, it, I'm too young to say never, it's just not yet. Um, there's bigger and more rewarding challenges, I think, close to home now. Um, but going out there just to enjoy it was phenomenal. Excellent. Um, Simon Lewis, Lewis asks, uh, uh, what is the one thing you cannot do without on any of your um, any adventure expedition? Is it a piece of kit you always have with you, or is it a sentimental or motivational item? Hi, Simon. Again, obviously, Simon helped out on the Walk for Nepal events himself. Um, so let me think. Um, it sounds very hypocritical, but I think my phone. Um, not because I want to be on, you know, you know, on Facebook, you know. A social media but I think just to have music um, I think in the moments in the really tough times it's been able to play music has really got me through um, you know uh, I've always kind of enjoyed music and I think sometimes when you're on your own for long periods of time on challenges uh, it can be a real motivator so not necessarily to have the signal and the, and the distractions because you want to get the time away from that that's the whole point uh, but having music uh, or some sort of music player for me um, I think is uh, is always very much a peace of mind thing as well. Um, and I think a decent waterproof, which I didn't have on Climber UK, I made a big, big mistake there. Um, I think uh, that was, uh, that's, always a, that's always a blessing really. So yeah, um, a music player and um, I'm, probably gonna, I'm probably gonna forget something else really, because I, I have so much kit with me on, on, you know, on these things, um, but that's always a lifesaver for me. Yeah, it's amazing how uh, if you're too wet or too cold, how it can suck any kind of uh, enthusiasm <laughs> enthusiasm out of you, isn't it? It's, uh... Uh, I would call a time where was it? I was, um, I think it was on the climb the UK challenge with. Uh, um, I, was, I was in the middle of uh, Glen Affric, which is one of the most remote valleys in Scotland, and I had a bit of a meltdown because it was wet, cold, exhausted, scared, alone, nothing left to give, and it was. Um, it was one of those days when you kind of can't see the top and then you then the cloud lifts and you realize it's a false summit and the real one's miles away. I just think I sat there and cried to myself. Um, and it was, um, I think it was run rig, Lot Lomond came on the, came on the eye and I was just belting it out, singing along at full volume because there was nobody around to hear. And it's amazing what it can do for the spirits. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it can be a great motivator. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, just uh, just go to this question, I think. Um, yeah, I w actually, I want to just talk, we'll dip into a few other questions in a minute, but I just want to talk about um, sort of mental health for a minute. I know you've obviously touched on it already. Um, and uh, you touched on social media, particularly there. You said about carrying your phone, although you said it's not because you want to be on social media. But um, I just want to know, um, what I mean, what, what's your thoughts on social media and its, its kind of role in adventures and mental health? On, on one side, it obviously helps someone like yourself um, communicate that you've been there and done that. And I know that's not necessarily the purpose of what you do. But on the other, it's, it's you know, all this screen time and all this seeing other people do stuff is can't, can't be that good for mental health. Well, it's kind of not, is it? I think it's been proven that it's not. So just get your thoughts on that. Really interesting question, and um, and yeah, I mean, I do enjoy being able to share the adventures and the moments, you know, with people. 
uh, I do get, I do enjoy getting to share those stories. And it's not about, you know, look where I am. Look where you, it's just, I love being able to try and put that into words and try and capture that moment. You know, if, if I've been on, a, you know, I've been on an amazing hill run at sunrise and it, I just get this, there's this magic feeling that I want to try and capture. And, and, you know, I love being able to share that and see, you know, others and, and get inspired by where they've been. And, uh, you know, I want to you know explore it as well. That's the positive about it. It's about broadening horizons and, and finding out about things. And I think there's a great online community. Um, I've met so many great friends through, you know, through social media, through the outdoors, that when it came to my challenge, they were able to come out and be part of it, which is fantastic. You know, some of those have become great friends. That's lots of the positives, but I think there is a very careful balance. Um, recently, I've actually kind of just come back from kind of two or three weeks, you know, where I went offline. Um, I think because my work, you know, speaking and writing is very much kind of a creative process and there's only so much energy for that you have. And social media can, when you, you know, when you have kind of, you know, when you have sponsors and you do various things, it can become a commitment. And um, ultimately, you know, it can take a lot of, a lot of your mental energy away just trying to maintain that um and and yeah it becomes addictive it's designed to be addictive and i think uh, if you're already struggling or feeling you know feeling bad it can it can give you a sense of connection but also it can make you feel worse um you know especially if you're not able to do things that others are during lockdown i really feel for the people that haven't been able to get outside as much i've been lucky that you know here in kendall um i've been able you know on my you know on my exercises i can get out and run on the hills um but but equally i felt conscious that other people might be feeling worse about that so it's uh, it's something that needs to be managed and i think and uh and carefully filtered you know we have full control over it what you know of what we see and how we react to it but um at the same time there's a real risk of comparison and you know feeling inferior and i think uh it's important to keep check on what we're seeing and how much of that is realistic um and not using it as some kind of yardstick for ourselves and uh after that two, three weeks away, just reducing the stress of having to respond to things and just to check things when we find ourselves just reaching for our phones instinctively, um, I think it's, it's healthy um, because it can become quite consuming. Um, but equally, you know, it's, uh, it's quite nice to go on long runs and see nice things without feeling the need to get a picture for Instagram, um, but it can be fun as well. So I think uh, there's a careful argument for both, um, but ultimately, you know, we have to keep in control of that. And uh, I, I read recently that we spend an average of 24 hours a week on our mobile phones. Now, whether that's true or not, but you think of how much we could use that time in more beneficial ways um, to go in the hills sometimes without our phones, just to enjoy it for ourselves without having to get a good picture of it um, is quite liberating. So, uh, yeah, getting some time off is, is really good, I think. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, <laughs> so, um, Next question would be um, just sticking on on um, on the mental health um, subject for a, a little bit longer. I mean, um, you've you've created your this um, you've created Mind Over uh, Mountains, which um, is you know leading on from the sort of social media thing. It, it is designed to to get more people out into the hills. Can you tell us a, a little bit more about that as well? Yeah, sure. So yeah, it's a new project. Uh, it's almost a charity. You know, we've you know we're still in that process now, but at the moment we're a community interest company, so kind of a social enterprise. And we started this um, about two years ago with Adventure Uncovered, and it's it's kind of grown from that idea where we wanted to do an event to, you know, help people um, get in the hills for their you know, you know, for their mental, uh, you know, a physical health. Um, I think for me personally, it's been the most powerful medication I've tried. You know. I've been, you know, on medication. I've been through those various, you know, you know, you know the various options and treatment. Um, but it took so long to get it that it almost became useless. And for me, it was always getting outside again, having a goal, something to get me out of bed in the morning, that actually was a lot more powerful. And I think as a natural intervention, we've lost touch with that. Um, so I really feel that, you know, by staying active and being outside more often, um, we can prevent a lot of these issues getting to the where they are. So ultimately, I wanted to, to help more people access that. Um, and we did an event in the lakes two years ago, which was a big success, uh, where we didn't just com you know, didn't just offer the hill walking, but combine that with uh, NLP, uh, mindfulness, and you know, and inspirational speakers. So there's that full like, you know, that full uh, holistic approach. 
um, which is a lot more powerful because there's lots of people just doing days in the hills, but actually having the self-help skills and resilience, I think is really important. Getting people away from the phones for, you know, for, you know, two days, joining a, a group of people like them um, because it can be very isolating and you know, have no idea what other people are dealing with. Um, you know, I certainly didn't. So I think it's just getting people into that kind of safe space. So ultimately, after the success of that one, uh, we did another event last year um, and we had two events planned this year in the lakes and the peaks, which obviously were postponed because of COVID. So naturally, we, you know, we, we want to reach out to everybody, you know, who needs us. And I think at the moment we've been looking for ways that we can support people that have been affected by the, you know, the, you know, by the last sort of few months of lockdown, because let's face it, I think our mental health has been affected more than ever. Um, and I think all the challenges of that, you know, people need to reconnect with the outdoors more than ever to support those most affected. So we are doing two events um, in the lakes and the peaks again uh, next month where we're doing small groups. So we can obviously maintain, you know, the, you know, the max group size. Um, I think the uh, social distancing rules are six at the moment. So we've got kind of smaller ratios and we're doing all, uh, all the mindfulness, all the coaching all online instead. Again, you know, more Zoom you know you know you know it's more time on zoom but hey you know we have to adapt um and we're doing that in the short term just as a way to to help people get outside safely and responsibly because you know we've heard a lot of negative news about the, about you know the parks and people going there in crowds and we don't want to add to that so we're doing that um, and offering bursaries for you know people who you know are unemployed because obviously there's been a lot of financial hardship um, and also the frontline workers who've had to deal with all the trauma so if anybody wants to also find out more about that, I know you've put a link in the chat to um, on the events and obviously on our site as well. But, uh, you know, we do have bursaries available um, and access to, to actually subsidise counselling for people who need it. Because, uh, yeah, we've all had a, an unclimbed mountain recently, you know, myself included. Oh, that's great. Alex. So just, just for people on Facebook who can't see the link, we will post the link on there after this. But it, it's mindovermountains.org.uk forward slash events. And um, interestingly, um, a question that we had from Jennifer Tankard, um, she, she asks, it's been great to see so many people get into outdoor fitness during lockdown. And how do you think you can re-energize grassroots outdoors activity post lockdown? So I think that kind of links into, um, into what we were just talking about, really about Mound Over Mountains. And yeah. I think interesting question. Um, I mean, again, it has been it has been strange, you know, when Boris said that, you know, we were allow one form of exercise, you know, each day. Um, it's like Boxing Day. Every man and his dog is out walking, and it's certainly been lucky that we've had glorious sunshine, which has helped. Um, and I think when things are taken away, people appreciate them so much more. Um, and I think that's that's great, and I hope that habit keeps up. I hope people do realise the benefits more um, of being active every day. I, I think. I'm hoping that because of that, because we've seen and experienced that, I really hope that will um, change our attitude and culture towards it, and that people will see the importance of, you know, of access, you know, to these things in the long term. You know, not just during the lockdown time. And I, and I hope that includes, you know, more funding and more attention to those sort of projects. Um, because, you know, after the mental health challenges we've had during this time and during the ongoing uncertainty. I really think that um, people are going to need to need that as part of the process to recover. Um, so I think I think ultimately as well, you know, we've we've been we've been isolated, we've been disconnected from each other, and I think if we, it, I think people are going to be very keen to be reconnected. So I think if we keep that as our narrative and um, you know use that as an opportunity, I think um, that itself will will be a good opportunity to set new things up. Um, so I think it's just about bringing people back together is is the message for me and. Uh, you know, trying to reach out to the people that have been most affected. I think it's hard to see what that might look like because everybody's sort of still working out what's going on. Um, but I think if we, we've, we've proven the need, so let's hope it changes attitudes. That's great. Alex, um, campsites reopen this weekend. Uh, have you a favourite campsite or do you just prefer wild camping? Um, I normally stay in hostels. I'm a real wimp, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> um, massively white chase. I'm a bit, bit biased, but um, I do prefer hostels. And there's some great ones around the UK that I think give you a great base to go off and do things and run. Um, and I know the hostels are opening again soon. Um, I do prefer wild camping. Uh, I think I, you know, I love the whole 
just the whole freedom of it um being able to, to, to be out in the hills and wake up to a, a sunrise in the mountains for me is uh, is magical um but since moving up in cumbria i'll be honest i i, I tend to prefer to get up really early and go back home um yeah. so yeah. i've not camped on a campsite for a while but if i had to say uh, a wild camping spot just before lockdown um started um you know, me and a friend went up to camp on uh, um, on Home Fell near Coniston, and uh, just to get a night away from the chaos of what was going on in the world. And then, mm. actually, it was it was blissful um, to see the sunrise over Coniston Water, and then come back to the news and just you know the mood goes flat again. Um, so I think just to get out in the fells and the lakes will be uh, on my list very soon. Yeah, that's great. Um... Few more questions from people then, uh, if I may. The uh, let's go with um, uh, well, actually, we'll go with Dom Dom Ainsley, who um, is actually he also lives in the lakes. Um, he asks, how how do you structure your training? So you've been doing quite a lot of running recently. Yeah. Um, I know he's a big big runner yeah. as well. Um, so yeah, how do, how do you structure your training? Yeah, hi Dom. Um, on the running side of it, I've come from kind of a road running you know, background. Uh, until recently, you know, I've, I've always kind of, you know, I've trained sort of 5K uh, up to kind of road marathon. Um, and so typically, you know, for me, a training week would, you know, would always be one rest day. And then I'd do sort of two or three speed sessions, um, and, you know, a long run, um, you know, an easy mileage in between. Um, since moving in the lakes, I've been a bit more freestyle. I've been doing a lot more in the fells, which I'm sure you know is a different type of training. And as a result, I've lost my speed, um, and you know, and I've spent a lot of time falling over instead. Um, last year was very much um, I didn't run at a very good level. I just kind of just enjoy being in the fells and getting to get kind of you know to get stronger in the hills instead. Um, but I didn't necessarily follow a structured plan other than having a long run every weekend in the fells um, and. You know the odd, you know the, you know the odd hill race. Um, I felt very frustrated that not really having a goal in mind uh, was difficult to to follow any structured plan. Um, so yeah, uh, more recently, obviously, I've got you know I've got my next project in mind, and so I have had a coach, which has obviously helped me to have more structure. Generally, it's on a four-week cycle. You know, you know, it's an easy week, then it builds, then a peak week. Um, you know, of mileage intensity, but. You know, as an ultra challenge, I've had to adapt once again because um, I'm used to speed sessions and, you know, and I was good, you know, I go faster. Uh, but now I've had to kind of accept myself as a plodder, um, less intensity, more long, easy mileage, um, which in some ways has been nice because I've been able to do more and, it's, and, and, and see more. Um, so ultimately, yeah, that's what I've been doing recently. Um, I'm now not coach, so I'm now trying to train myself, uh, which, which I think works well for me. Um, I've always done my own thing, um, but it's it's following that 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 kind of rough schedule really, and trying to avoid injuries. So it's my kind of common challenge. Great, um, thank you for that. Uh, so a question from Heather uh, Lundbeck. Uh, I want to do a challenge, but I'm also safety conscious. As someone who wants to set themselves a challenge but isn't sure how to make sure they can do it safely, what would you recommend? Um, what sort of advice would you give? in order to allow her to upskill um, so that she can do something a bit more challenging? Great question, yeah. I think ultimately it depends on what you're interested in, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, if it's mountaineering, if it's running, if it's cycling and, and what those risks are. I think at the moment, obviously, we've got all the frictions in place and it's, it's a bit difficult. Um, you, know, you know, I know my challenge is, is on hold. Um, it's, you know, it's good to go soon, um, but obviously it's, you know we're in a pandemic and, and I've got to be responsible so I think to, to have an idea of what those risks are first and foremost and how you mitigate those there's always going to be an element of risk um, it just depends on how much of those you're willing to take um, but ultimately I think it's you know it's getting you know the experience in those places for example if it's mountaineering it might be doing a skills course first you know so you get the good background knowledge as a foundation um, if it's running in the hills, you know, it might be to join a club to just get more time with people to, you know, to learn, you know, you know, you know, to try to learn from them. Um, if you're looking at doing, you know, organized events, I mean, again, they have a lot of safety kind of in place and procedures. So 
I, I guess it depends what you're looking you know for really most of my challenges have, have been very much a kind of a, an independent self-propelled thing where I'm kind of putting myself out there but ultimately I think it really depends on where you going to be um and then spending a lot of time just building just i think you know you know i think just actually building up to that you know not throwing yourself too much in the deep end um staying within a comfortable level of your expertise and experience so that you're not pushing yourself too far and potentially putting yourself in danger um but ultimately that only comes from experience and practice and um, you know you know you don't climb everest in a week you have to climb lots of peaks in the alps and the himalayas beforehand so i think it's just a pragmatic approach getting advice being around people that have been there learning from them and um and yeah enjoying the process yeah definitely i think a good i mean a good place to start is um because you're you're a um an outside champion aren't you os yes uh, is, yeah. so probably a good place to start is um is ordnance survey and refresh your map skills and um depends obviously on what challenge you want to do but yeah they, get, get that confidence they have a great hub actually on their site at the moment where there are lots of resources and maps and guides for all sorts of challenges. And I think, I think ultimately it's just to join a club to be with, with people like that around you that are doing similar things. And, um, you know, if you're not confident on your own to begin with, then, you know, do a joint challenge, do an organized event just to build up that experience. Yeah, it's great. Great advice. Thank you. Um, a few questions that come in around this, this topic. So I'll ask it. Um, have what's your favorite what's your favorite mountain or, or, or peak that you've summited not many <laughs> um, <laughs> i think uh you know i love the lakes i mean that's why i kind of came came up here it's always been very special because that's where my everest dream was first inspired um and there's so many up here and so many more to do and during lockdown i've been trying to tick them off close to home um I think Suta Fell, which is near Blancafra, was, was actually where I had that Everest kind of vision and, and moment. So that will always be special for me. Um, anywhere in Buttermere, that whole valley, all the, those peaks, um, I loved a bit, especially on a kind of a clear summer night. Um, in terms of bigger peaks, I mean, Mont Blanc was my kind of my, my very first biggish mountain. Uh, I summited that at sunrise in July 2012. And... Uh, and yeah, that that was a, a, spe a really special moment for me. So I think it's difficult to say a favourite peak. Um, but for me, running in the fells and sunrise in the lakes is uh, is magical. And it still blows my, it still blows my mind even now. So I think uh, anywhere in the South Lakes, you know, is, is, is great for me. But even my local hill, uh, uh, Benson Knot, you know, I can get there within probably half an hour from the front door and it still blows me away. So... Anywhere up high, I'll do really. Um, question from Molly Dutton. Uh, she she says, "How do you get into inspirational, motivational speaking, um, and what what do you think makes a good speaker?" Really interesting question. Thanks, Molly. Um, I've been lucky enough that through my challenges, I've kind of had a had a, oh, you know, it seems I've got a kind of a story to share um, because you know I'm now fortunate enough that I'm able to speak to you know, kind of schools and businesses around, you know, around, around the UK and in Europe now. And it's a phenomenal journey to be able to share what I've learned in a business context and try and inspire people to overcome their challenges as well. Um, and so how did I get into it? It kind of happened by chance because as a stammerer, um, for me, speaking on the phone is, is a nightmare. You know, I can speak to 500, 600 people in a room fine, um, but then I can get on the train home and not be able to ask for a ticket. You know, I've smashed up phones at home for the frustration of being able to say my own name. So that itself is an advantage because it kind of makes me very unusual for a speaker. Um, but what it was, was my old school asked me to go and speak um, before Everest. As you know, it was before Mont Blanc. And just to, you know, inspire the kids. And, and ultimately, I would have ran away. You know, I would have said no. Um, because even at school, I used to hide in the toilet sometimes to get out of speaking in class. But I think I got into that mindset of saying yes to everything and actually realizing that I could do so much more than I thought I could. And actually, if I can inspire people, well, I can't say no to that. You know, I, I can't say no to an opportunity to actually, you know, share what I'm, you know, share what I've learned. Um, and I, I did it. I'd never been so scared in my life. And once it'll, 
it sounds basic, but like anything, once you've done it once, you realize it, it gets easier and easier and easier. Um, just like talking on mental health, you know, that first time is terrifying. And ultimately from then after, you know, after Everest went wrong, um, there became more of a story to tell. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I started to look for more opportunities. I started contacting schools and I guess people heard more about it. I got the chance to speak more and more. So I think I was lucky that I kind of had a bit of a break with those two disasters and people naturally want to hear about Everest. It's always got that appeal as a motivational speaker. Um, and nowadays, you know, it's my, you know, it's my main job. I'm able to, you know, do that to, you know, you know, kind of events and businesses and, and, um, you know, get some more practice. The, the stamina is still there, but it's, it's part of me and, uh, it's part of that journey. And I think, uh, in terms of what makes a good speaker, I mean, well, I'm obviously still on that journey. Um, don't want to speak for myself, but, uh, I think having coaching early on, um, helped me to learn a lot. And, um, you know, I, I think it is about being authentic. It's about being you. And, uh, you know, after all these years, the journey's changed. I've had to learn new things, but ultimately going back to, to why I'm doing this and, you know, what, why I'm on the stage is about overcoming challenges and letting people see, see, you know, see the real you, you know, you can do all the coaching, you can do all the, you can get all the skills of how to present, but I think you've got to have a good story and you've got to have that passion. Um, because if you don't believe in yourself, if you don't believe in the message, um, then other people are going to are going to pick up on that. So, I think yeah, be authentic, have a great story, and prepare and practice. You know, and uh, all the things like you know being able to pace yourself and you know not say um and ah and all that. It just comes with practice. Yeah, it's tricky, tricky one to master. When I look back on, in fact, some of these talks that we've done, a lot of ums and ahs coming out there. Um, <laughs> Mary uh, Mary Guy asks, uh, "Have you have you climbed Killy?" I haven't. No. Interestingly, I, I was going to do that kind of before Everest, but I I realised going off going to the Himalayas was was more specific. It was a lot more useful for my prep. Um, I'd like to go out there. It's not high on my priority list, but I think I've got time. So at some point, I'm sure I get out there. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm I'm sure you'll you'll succeed where I didn't. So that's uh, that's good. With, with my luck, Mark, I wouldn't chance it. <laughs> um you uh you mentioned that you'd like this is from verity hey she says you mentioned that you'd like people to keep going outside um and would need a community to do this how do you see this being done i think that was more along the lines of you were saying that people should sort of join up with other people and and maybe mm -hmm. join a club and things like that wasn't that i think it's a good question because i think recently we've been in this real surreal time where suddenly from from kind of shouting, you know, from shouting off the rooftops, you know, be outside, get outside. We've been saying, no, no, don't go outside, come back, stay away from each other. And it's been surreal because we've not really known what to do with ourselves. Um, and I've been a bit confused during this time as well because um, we've obviously had to stay safe and do our bit and be responsible. Um, and we still do. And I think ultimately now is, um, you know, especially in minor mountains, we're just trying to provide opportunities for people to, to reconnect with, you know, with other people that have been in the similar position. Um, you know, I think the outdoor community was, was there beforehand for the festivals, for the, you know, for the events, for, you know, and generally once, once restrictions lift, those events and opportunities and festivals will start to open up again, people will be able to come back together. Um, but in the meantime, a lot of that has gone online, you know, like now tonight, we've been able to do these things, there's the forums um, and, you know, there's new ways to connect with people that share the interest. Um, but I think in the meantime, you know, we, we might not be able to do the, to, you know, do the, to, you know, do the, 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 you know, the big events and groups. But I think ultimately it's about, uh, it's about finding new ways to connect in the meantime online and looking for those. And I, I'm not totally aware of that, but I know um, a great way to do that. Um, if you look at Wildbase, they do their, you know, you know, these, you know, They've done kind of a number of actual virtual things online where people, you know, where people join along. There's a speaker, there's, you know, there's guests, there's a QA. and a And you really feel like you're at home. You know, you're chatting to people like you. Um, and I think that for me is what keeps the spirit alive, is looking for things online um, and looking for new opportunities. And, and we will get back out there. You know, it's just going to have to do things in a different way for now. So, sorry, that's not a very good answer because I think we're still working it out. Um, mm. But I think it will it will come. If that no, helps. I think it's good. I think yeah, 
I think there'll be a lot of people who are keen to get back out there and using using groups like Meetup and things like that um, certainly will help. But for the moment, yeah, it's um, it's just doing what you can online. But um, one, one question that Guy asked, and time's sort of getting on, so we'll probably just ask two more questions if I may, Alex. But yep. um, Guy asks, what do you think uh, is beneficial to the mind for inner city kids to get out into the hills? And how would you make it a regular thing for them to do it? Not just a one-off trip. I think this is this is talking about um, mind over mountains and whether you were focusing on any sort of kids and getting them out into the hills specifically. Good question, Guy. Yeah, I think at the moment for these events um, next month, it has been focused more on people in the north, which has been quite badly hit actually by the virus. You know, I think uh, in Cumbria has the second highest rate of infections outside of London. But equally, we know that you know people in you know people in the big cities have had less access to the outdoors, and uh, you know a lot of people don't even have a private garden. You know, it makes you feel very very fortunate for you know all the things I have up here. Um, so ultimately, you know, at the moment we're a very small project, but with funding and with plans, we're looking to you know expand to every national park in the UK so that we can help to connect people with their nearest places. You know, okay, they might be a long long way away from the lakes or from Snowdonia. Um, but they might be able to get, you know, the, you know, the South Downs or, you know, the Brecon Beacons. And, and ultimately when those events are in, you know, are in place, um, you know, uh, on the bursary basis and also partnering with organizations and charities, uh, you know, our aim you know, absolutely is to, you know, to give these experiences available. Um, but also not, as you say, not just, a, not just, you know, as a one-off, because as we say, that's not going to make a lasting change. We need people to, to make the outdoors part of a habit, um, you know, because that weekend can give them the spark and give them the skills, but they, they then need to be able to get out more often. Um, so we've got plans for that in terms of, you know, you know, you know, they're having events, you know, a weekends where people can just head back out together, um, you know, to make it more of a, you know, a regular thing where people can access the outdoors in a supported and guided environment. So I think at the moment, um, you know, we're, it's you know it's the early stages, um, but we are certainly trying to look for ways that we can help people in the cities to get outside because they're the people that probably need it most. So I guess keep tuned on that really. Um, at the moment, you know, we're just encouraging people to to make the best use of the of the space they do have. You know, whether it's parks nearby or just walking, you know, you know, just out in the gardens. Um, that's certainly better than nothing, I think, at the moment. And uh, we're just looking at how we can access to people that you know don't get to the national parks great thanks Alex. um i just want to end on this question which weirdly enough has not been asked by anyone but i know you get asked it all the time um so i'm going to ask um oh before i do i've just put on the last screen that you can see there is um obviously if you want to find out any more about alex then please get in touch with him via any of those channels he's, he's also said that if we didn't get a chance to get to your question tonight then please feel free to um tweet him or, or get in touch with him on facebook or or instagram and um you'd be happy to sort of respond probably in the next not in the next day or two because you're a bit tied up with an event tomorrow but as soon as you you can i think yeah, you will get that. um but the final question would be uh what is planned for post lockdown for alex well i guess we're coming out of lockdown in some way now and I know it's all very uncertain um you know it's a day at a time we can't plan much further than that um I did have a project planned um to actually try to run the national three peaks uh which was pr it's probably going to be my toughest challenge to date um I think running has been my big focus the last two years especially being in the lakes now and uh it's probably um probably safer than Everest my mum will be glad to hear um, so that has obviously been put on hold because uh, that was going to be in May. Um, I've been very grateful actually to have more time and to be more ready, to be more prepared. That'll be fundraising, you know, actually for Mine of, you know, for Mine of the Mountains again. So uh, that's ready. We're just waiting for the, uh, you know, for the uh, green lights, so to speak. Um, but that all involved running uh, 400, 450 miles between the National Free Peaks uh, unsupported. Um, so I've started on Ben Nevis and obviously finished on Snowden, all being well. Um, running nearly the equivalent of two marathons a day. Now, as I said, I come from a road running background, so I'm in new territory. Um, but uh, as I said, you've kind of got to push the boat out, I think. And uh, 
yeah, um, it's definitely in that borderline fear of, you know, can I do this? And, uh, and, you know, I don't know if I can run 450 miles, but I can definitely run a mile 450 times. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, um, right now it's just about finding the right time to do that safely and responsibly um, in all three countries. But to people uh, go to my site um, and follow me, they'll find out more about that. That's great. Thank you, Alex. Um, for just as a way of saying thank you to everyone for joining us tonight, I'm just about to post a link to um, um, an online form that if you fill it out, then you can have a chance to win a, a £50 Alice Brigham voucher between now and Friday night. It closes. Um, and Alex has very kindly said that he'd also add a signed copy of his uh, Another Peak book, which yep. is, covers his uh, exploits um, of when he climbed all 100 of the UK's highest points um, in 72 days, wasn't it? Is that right? Record breaking? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so Alex will also put that in as well. So, um, so uh, good luck to everyone that entered that and thank you very much for joining us. Big thank you to you, Alex. I'm sorry to those who we didn't get a chance to cover all your questions, but that's been really, really interesting. And um, thanks for sharing your story again, Alex. Um, and well, thank good you luck. Good luck with the uh, yeah. Good luck with the three peaks when time comes. We'll be looking, watching out for that. Uh, just somebody just said the survey link isn't working. Uh, does anyone want to check that? Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, up again, it's been great, and I think uh, yeah, we've had a really interesting year, but we've got to make the best of it. And uh, yeah, looking forward to getting back out there. I've had a couple of years off, and uh, you know, dealing with those personal challenges, and um, now I'm looking forward to getting on a, an outdoor challenge and uh, putting one foot in front of the other. So. Uh, Yes. So, you know, you know, you know, just, you know, see, uh, you know, a big, you know, a big thank you for everybody for being here tonight and um, yeah, stay safe and uh, look forward to seeing you in the hills. And uh, if you do want more information on the mind of, on the mind of, mind of, mind of the mountains events, um, the website's there as well. That's great. Thanks. Thanks again, Alex. I will post the, the, the proper link that works in a second, if you bear with me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Alex. See you again. Bye. Bye.